Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm like Ray. Uh, the word no-till is not on my slide. I start with the word residue first. It's residue that protects the soil. It's residue that's helping feed the soil system. It's residue is what I want to keep out there. Now, Dwayne's talking after me, so I'm not sure what all he's going to cover, but I had the benefit of watching these three guys in front of me to know what they're talked about. And I actually had two different presentations loaded for today. And the one was a more in-depth on cover crops, how to and what all, uh, all it can do for you. The other was more for them, the residue and soil structure. Well, when the original program came out, Jim Horman was going to talk more about cover crops. What did he do? He switched more to soil biology and I'm like, or soil compaction. So I'm like, all right, which presentation? This is a blend. It's called Adjust on the Go. The beauty of PowerPoint and computer. So anyway, when it comes down to it, I'm going to make a statement point blank. Jim talked about soil compaction. Statement point blank is tillage has never built soil structure. Tillage destroys the existing soil structure. Now, if you've got a bad structure like compaction and you can reach it with your tillage implement and you break up the soil structure, the bad compaction, that's good, right? But what if you have a good structure? Or what if you have the compaction and you break that up, you broke up all the structures there, the next pass in the field can create more compaction. It's a vicious circle when it comes to tillage. But when I look at tillage and I start thinking about water management, years ago there were some researchers say, studying the soil that said, you know, the average siltworm soil holds two inches of water per foot. You till it six inches deep, that's one inch of water affected, about half of it goes away. That's how these kind of numbers show up. Now, half inch in an average year before planting, who cares? Maybe I have irrigation, maybe I got another spring rain coming, maybe the soil's too wet anyway and you gotta till it to dry it out. You've all heard that. Never do that, by the way. But when you start thinking about it, what if we did in the olden days, there was three, four tillage passes, half inch per trip, we dried out two inches of water, remember two inches per foot. The olden days, everybody had fur openers on their planters trying to push away the dry soil and clods trying to find moisture to plant into. That's expensive half inch per trip. Now, very few of us do four trips anymore pre-plant. You know, some guys are down on one trip, some guys are one in the fall, one in the spring, whatever. But I start looking at that, where's my residue? Where's my soil biological life? Think about what else is going on out there. Without residue there, to keep the wind off the soil surface, we have wind erosion problems. Without residue there, absorb raindrop impact. That energy detaches those soil particles, then they start washing on us. You know, we still got a triple whammy here, we got the yellow unproductive soil up there because all the good stuff washed away. We got the gullies there where it washed out crop, cut some gullies, hell on the sprayer going across them. Down at the bottom, sealed it in some crop. That's all because of lack of residue to absorb raindrop impact and a lack of soil structure to let the water soak in where it lands. And again, tillage erases all that. So we want to go away from the tillage. Now even if you don't have slopes and erosion problems, there's still an infiltration problem. You know, I, growing up many, many years ago in northeast Nebraska, I thought it was great to have a crust in the soil. Dad put me out on the tractor, he says, you get to drive 10 miles an hour, the rotary hoe trying to break that up. Wait a minute, that's not great. When you look at that, you know, this farmer is digging a screwdriver, and if you know where to look, you can almost see corn plants trying to come through there. I look at the other way, crop can't get up, more importantly, the water can't get in. If water can't get in, it's going to run off. So again, I want to build structure. Now, I say this is many years ago. Uh, we've got farmers now that cut way back on tillage. They're leaving residue out there. We had to. The 85 Farm Bill said, residue cover. It's going to solve our erosion problems. And eh, it didn't quite. It helped. But when it comes down to it, we're still not doing ourselves a favor when it comes to soil structure. 1981, I uh, received a grant for three years to study different tillage systems. I actually started working with no-till in 78 with my master's thesis. In 81, I established a set of plots southeast Nebraska, about 10 miles east of Lincoln, to silty clay loam soil and dry land. And at that time, grain, sorghum, soybeans were popular crops for dry land Nebraska. Corn varieties weren't quite there yet for that location in the state. So I did grain, sorghum, soybean rotation for a number of years. This picture was taken about the uh, mid-90s. I loved no-till, I loved the residue. Now, remember, I started no-tilling back before we had cheap glyphos. You know, at that time, Roundup was only about $100 a gallon. I learned to no-till without that. Now, to be truthful, today I do love Roundup Ready beans. As such, I hate Roundup Ready corn. With my crop rotation, I don't want to use Roundup in the corn year. We don't. 
and I don't because we put down our early pre-plant, get it rained in and activated, and that's what we learned back in the 80s when we didn't have all the post-emerge products. Our pre-emerge products rained in a couple weeks ahead of planting. When I plant, all my moisture, all my nutrients are there for my crop. Weeds haven't been using them. But the other thing is I love the residue. Every bean is up and growing because the soil moisture was protected. It's not going to crust, not going to wash out, not going to dry out. In the tilled side, there's some beans under crust. There's some beans in dry soil. Some beans never going to grow. But when it really comes to soil health, take a look at the average elevation of this soil surface compared to this over here. There's about a four inch step there. That many years of tillage compared to that many years of not tilling. Jim talked about it, sand, silt, and clays and organic materials, those are our solids in the soil. The air space, the pore space is air and water. Should be about half pore space, half solids. As I come through doing tillage, I break up the soil structure the solids are not compressed. What happens is the pores are squeezed out of the soil particles between them. And what happens is they reappear on top, a lack of soil structure. This soil is denser than this. This soil has less pore space. Those less pores fill up with water quicker. The soil gets saturated quicker. And worse than that, it dries out quicker because you don't have the storage there. And so a lot of guys will tell you, say, well, my soils are too wet. Well, they're too wet for a couple of days and they're too dry in the next couple of days. No, mine is a lot more buffered, and that's what I like about soil structure. And again, a lot of guys say, well, I no-till. It has to be continuous no-till to get the soil health. It has to be a continuously fed soil system to get the soil health. You know, the year he planted this corn no-till in the bean residue, yes, he saved trips, not doing tillage, he saved some fuel, saved some labor, but that's still a tilled soil when it comes to crusting, when it comes to runoff, when it comes to lack of infiltration, when it comes to lack of soil biological life. So it's continuous no-till that does it. And here's an example of about 12 years continuous no-till here. We can see some good peds and aggregates like Ray talked about. We can see where water can soak in. We can see where roots can penetrate. Walked across the fence, this is the same soil type, continuous tillage. You can imagine heavy rain, you can see why we get runoff. Or flat soils, you can see why we get ponding. Again, I want to build that soil structure to get that healthy soil out there. Again, the tillage destroys it rapidly. You know, the disc is one of the worst offenders. That was developed as a compaction tool to build roads, to build, break up existing soil structure and create a subgrade compaction layer to build a road. I don't know why we thought we could use it in farming systems. But when you start thinking about it, again, I show this for compaction. Uh, Jim talked about compaction. The full width tillage compaction, you hardly ever see. I saw it because I had no till next to it. Jim said, compare it to your fence row. You can see how that's been beat down. Yes, it looks like it's been fluffed up, but that weight of that disc is carried underneath, and on wet soils, the wet soil particles are lubricated, they compact more easily. Again, earlier I said you may have heard it say, I gotta till that wet soil to dry it out. That's exactly the worst time to till it when it comes to soil health, because it does destroy soil structure. Now some people say, I'm gonna till shallower. I'm gonna get one of these new colder tillage tools. That's exactly the worst layer to till. That's the one with your soil biological life you're trying to build. Why destroy that and then pack below it where you're trying to put the seed? The other form of compaction is shown back here, wheel traffic compaction. Typically, wheel tracks are as deep as you tilled because, again, tillage you erase soil structure, there's nothing there to support you. So again, it's a vicious circle here. Now, wheel traffic compaction, larger tires, reduced PSI, more footprint on the ground, more axles to carry the load, that's how I reduce those, and build soil structure, I'll reduce those. But even if the soil's dry, you're not doing yourself a favor doing tillage. Yes, I'm breaking up clods. Why? We created them with the previous tillage pass. Now, this is going to be an extreme example. This is a wheat fallow producer out in western Nebraska. He is an organic wheat fallow producer, so every time he's got to flush the weeds, he does another tillage trip. Now, earlier I said tillage doesn't build soil structure. I'm wrong. Tillage actually built a soil structure that we call massive. It has taken every pore space out of that soil. Now, the soil surface is right above this, and the residue is just sort of hanging down into this hole that we dug. Below this, he's been disking on his first pass, and then he switches over to sweeps and blades, and we found layers in there. You could actually pick that out, and you could find the smear mark from the blade, the sweep, or whatever that ran in there. Now, depending upon the year, he had anything between 13 to about 18, 19 trips for tillage on his wheat fallow rotation, because remember, he has about 14 months he's doing tillage. Look below that layer, though some beautiful soil structure that freeze thaw water and dry and builds. But you know what, if my roots can't get there, my water can't get there, this down here doesn't make any sense, doesn't make any difference. Don't do the tillage on top. 
organic wheat fallow. Ray Ward and I walked out there, and Ray, we should have paid attention. We should have made a crisper footprint. But take a look at that footprint. Take a look at that soil. Take a look at the lack of biological life. Does it look much different than that? <laughs> Neil Armstrong, we all know there's no life in the moon. I'm not sure there's much more life in that soil, is there? Again, we've done some dumb things at tillage. You know, this is the native soil structure out there. The grass, that was built by having a living root in that soil system that was actually growing there 10, 11, 12 months a year, depending on where you're at, what the winter is like. And it's having a living root putting carbon down in there. That's the darker soil we see. As we lose everything on top and as we erode that away, we get down to this. Again, to rebuild that, we need to get carbon back down in there. That's roots. That's going to be our cover crops, our cash crops. It's going to be perennial crops to rebuild it the fastest because perennial crops have set the roots down deeper. That's what built this to start with, was perennial grasses or gra a mixture of trees, grasses, forbs, whatever out there. Again, let's go back a little bit in history and some of the dumb things we've done. You know, the mower plow. Everyone says, ah, I've got to plow that soil to make a seed bed. You can still go to the Farm Progress Show and see plows being demonstrated. Yes, they're still being sold. But we start thinking about what we're doing. We're breaking up all the existing soil structure. We're coming in there, taking that non-uniform seed bed, and we're going in there and doing disking, field cultivation, or whatever. And this is a real bad example here. This is a, at Auburn, Alabama National Soil Tilth Lab, the compaction layer of the plow pan, where the plow packed below that. And then you can see some secondary pans from the discs and field cultivators. You see no soil structure up here in the root zone. Look down below, though. Beautiful soil structure. But again, if the water and roots can't get to it, we're in trouble. I'm an ag engineer by training. Ag engineers figured out a long time ago, you know, you take a stick out here, a shank, and put it down below this layer, and as you drag it through there, it's going to fracture it at 50, or about a 45 degree angle. So you put it 50% deep and put another shank over here, fracture that, I can fracture, I can break up the bad soil structure, compaction, right? The chisel plow was born. 12 inch shank spacing 12 inches deep. You go through there and you break up the bad soil structure of the compaction of the plow layer. And you come back and you smooth it out, pack it back down. After a few years, you took a... <laughs> All right, which one of you two were the plower and chiseler? <laughs> These two are laughing. You took a plow pan from 80 inches and you make a chisel pan at 12. Is that enough of a root zone to graze a crop in? Here's a photograph from someone's sales literature where they're selling a ripper. And I love this. When I was out there doing his last tillage operation, I think he got stuck here. And I don't know how he got out, but you can tell he had that big wide disc or field cultivator. And he came and he drove around here and hung that big wide disc or field cultivator over that wet spot. I have to till it to dry it out. He turned plenty wide so he wouldn't get stuck and came back and dried out the rest of it, right? Every time you do that, you now pack it tighter that next time it'll stay wet longer because the water can't soak in. I gave this presentation one time in Ohio, and I had a guy come up to me and said, I run a tile business. And there's guys who had this problem that hired me to cut in a random tile line to drain that wet spot. I go, yeah. He says, when I do that, I usually cut the pattern tile that was already installed, and it's because they created a compaction layer above the pattern tile. And again, I've seen it here in South Dakota. People are putting in tile to get rid of water. I'm going like, no, save the water, use the water. That's not get rid of it. Well, you saw the tire tracks there. Maybe I switched to tracks. Less compaction, right? Tracks work because of a couple things. One, it is lower PSI on the soil surface. I can do that with inflated tires as well. It's also got more axles. That's sort of axle one, axle two. These two together probably carry the weight of axle three. These are axle four. And again, think about trucks. When you go to the field or go to the road to carry more weight without destroying a road, we add more axles on a truck. Let's do that in our fields as well. I love tow carts. I love things that put more axles out there to carry the load because it's a lower weight per axle then. But again, you're not doing yourself a favor if you're doing tailage. Farmer friend of mine from Illinois, he's been chiseling for years. He's got a compaction layer down there about chiseling depth. Harvest time, he's got rice tires on his combine. Some people call them logger tires. If you're not familiar with them, they're a real tall lug to cut down through. Anybody's ever put rice lug tires in their combine emits two things. One, they admit they have no soil structure. They need that deep lug to cut through the mush. To cut down to number two, they admit they have a compaction layer, and that's where they're going to get their traction. Now, anybody brave enough to raise your hand? Do you have rice leg tires in your combine? 
We've done some dumb things to tillage, guys, because we're destroying our soil structure. Okay, plow pan at eight inches, a chisel pan at 12, 50% deeper, shank spacing equals operating depth. The V rippers were born. 18 to 20 inches deep, 18 to 20 inch shank spacing, and you got to like your fuel man and buy that big tractor. And we come along and we smooth it all out so we can plant. Destroy the soil structure, now we pack it down. You see what's coming. We've done some dumb things, haven't we? Is 18 to 20 inches enough of a root zone? That's me in my younger day. This is at Husker Harvest Days. DMI was showing off their new deep ripper, 30 inch shank spacing that run 30 inches deep. Remember, you've got to go 50% deep and then 20 inch layer. Fortunately, we've not seen a lot of those in Nebraska. You probably haven't seen too many in South Dakota because we haven't tilled the soils when they're that wet like they do back east. Again, never till a wet soil. You're going to create compaction. Simple as that. Is 30 inch enough for root zone? Look close under here. This is in Farm Journal Magazine on a contest they had said, I built the best. Mike Peeper, compaction doesn't have a chance and Mike Peeper deep rips with this rig he designed and built. 13 foot wide implement takes 320 horsepower to pull. Earlier I said you gotta like your fuel man. Mike's fuel man likes Mike. <laughs> We've done some dumb things guys. Let's go to no-till. Dwayne's going to talk about let mother do it. Mother nature, freeze thaw, wetting and drying, roots, build soil structure and leave residue out there. It's the residue that's going to make that system work. And again, a lot of guys say, well, do I need to go out and rip that up? Do I need to do strip till? To me, strip till is a temporary tool to get rid of a compaction layer that may have been caused from years of tillage, to open it up to get the crop planted, and the next year I can go no-till. Rent the tool. You don't need it every year. Once you get rid of the pan, if you don't reform it. That's how strip till works. You get rid of the pan on the first trip, don't reform it. Do some digging, spend some time in the spade. Look what you've got there. Now, if you're digging and your roots look something like this, there's no root restricting layer. The pan doesn't necessarily mean you gotta do tillage. A root restricting layer does. A water restricting layer does. Break that up. Iron can do it, roots can do it. I prefer roots, because they'll build soil structure. This is interesting. That's, uh, at Living History Farm in Des Moines, years ago, there was a display there. That's my finger point, the roots went all the way to the floor. Those roots went down and they actually spread out below the tillage layer. With no residue up here, there's no soil moisture up there, there's no roots up there. Now let's think about that quick quarter inch rain that blows through on a summer thunderstorm. Soaks in about an inch. No roots to pick that up, it dries out. I'm a no-tiller, I got residue up here, I got roots up here. That same rain means a lot to me meant nothing to my tilled neighbor. So again, think about the root system. Look, see what you've got in the soil. Leave residue out there. This is one of our fields already planted. Residue everywhere. That's what we want to see. That residue is going to be that mulch to keep the soil cooler and wetter at planting time. Yeah, yes, a little bit. But it's definitely going to keep it cooler and wetter the rest of the growing season. And that's what makes the money. You know, this past year, there was a lot of shortages of feed. You know, I can't fault someone who has to keep their livestock alive. Maybe this is a cheap form of feed for them. But you know what? It's a double whammy when it looks at what happens to the soil system as we take it away. For the guys who got greedy and are selling their residue, think of every one of those bales at least as a $20 bill. In about 1,000 pounds of residue there, you're going to put on at least 20 pounds of extra nutrients to pay for that, which you just hauled away. But think about what happens to the soil itself. I'm hauling away carbon that I can't even buy at the elevator. As we look at the... A lot of people say, well, that's already got half cover. You know, NRCS will tell you half cover is good for erosion control. Well, when it comes to moisture, reducing evaporation. Norm Clocky is an irrigation specialist down at K-State. He's been doing some work on measuring evaporation from residue-covered soil surfaces. With Bear, he's measuring about eight-tenths of an inch, or eight-hundredths of an inch per day. And you'll say, well, that's not much. Multiply a 100-day growing season. That's eight inches of water lost to evaporation. As he left cover out there, seven tenths, seven tenths, seven tenths, 100% cover was five tenths. That's three hundredths times 100 days is three inches of water difference. And I looked at that and says, wait a minute, conservation tillage says 30% cover cuts erosion in half, 50%, even 75% cover didn't cut water loss much. Why? 
And Norman explained it to me this way. He says, you know, you build the best house you can build. You got R19 insulation on the walls and R30 insulation on the ceilings and these triple pane windows. And the kids go out the door and leave the door open and all the heat gets out. Water does the same thing when it comes to residue cover. It follows a least path resistance preferential flow and the water comes out of the soil, the water vapor. He says you want at least 80%, 100% is better. Leave the soil covered. You can't afford to sell it because you just lost three inches of water in this case. Also, leave it upright, standing, catch the snow. That is moisture. I don't want that to blow away. And I want to catch it uniformly. You know, too often I hear from producers that, you know, the hilltop doesn't produce much, but boy, those valleys sure do. Well, if they did something like this and they lost all this moisture and they tilted and lost even more moisture, but down in the valleys where all their water ran off or all the snow accumulated, that's why there's differences. This is a no-tiller, left his residue standing, and he's got about the same snow catch everywhere. That's going to be more uniform soil temperature, more uniform soil moisture for planting next spring compared to this one. So again, leave the residue, leave it standing upright. Upright, anchored, attached, I don't have to cut it compared to flattened. Since it's attached, when I'm going through it, the soil holds it so I can pass across it. I love my residue, I want to leave it there. Uh, here's an example from our research farm of corn. Our corn residue we cut pretty high. It's rubbing the paint off of our front axle of the tractor, off of the planter toolbar. These are two visitors from the United Kingdom. They couldn't believe it and they had to take pictures. I had to take a picture of them taking pictures. But again, you can see how tall the residue is. And a lot of people say, well, all that residue holds the soil cold and wet. Well, if you knock it down early and you make a mat, you don't get any air movement down the soil surface. I leave it standing as long as I can so I get air movement of the soil surface so I get in there to plant earlier. I knock it down at planting time. You notice there's not a whole bunch of root balls rolled out. We're planting down the old row. The soil biological life and long-term no-till is that the root ball rots out from underneath. It doesn't roll over when you hit it with a planter. In fact, the soil biological activity is once I get the residue in contact with that soil biological life, my residue disappears in a hurry. Hey, that's okay. It's breaking down now, releasing carbon dioxide into the canopy. It's releasing carbon into the soil and releasing nutrients into the soil when my next crop is growing. Compared to my neighbor who did tillage this fall, it's releasing all that stuff now and his next crop won't be growing for another six months. So again, I want the residue to break down when the next crop is there. Now, I plant down the old row for crops in rotation. For corn on corn, we actually go beside the old row. Beside the old row for more uniform depth control, more uniform seed placement. If you really want to wear out your tractor tires real fast, plant exactly between the old rows and you'll wear them out because you're driving on the old row. So again, I leave the residue in place. I love rotation, I love wheat. Wheat gives me a cool season grass to go along with my warm season grass of corn. My warm season broadleaf is soybeans. As I go to the soybeans into wheat stubble in this case. Southeast Nebraska, a lot of guys say you can't plant soybeans until after May 5th in conventional tillage because the soil's not warm enough yet. May 5th, I already had them up and growing because I planted them in April 15th into 87 bushel wheat straw. The soil structure is such that the excess water soaked away. Cold, wet soil temperatures is because you can't soak away the water, build the structure, soak it down deeper, and no tilling into the heavy wheat straw is not a problem. Now let's go back to this. I started earlier. Half inch. Doesn't sound like much. Been doing a lot of work in my uh, early days. I had research grants with a rainfall simulator to measure the effects of residue and reducing the erosion. And that 30% level in conservation compliance came from research like this across the nation. We started doing demos for extension type meetings where we put out 100% cover, no cover. On the other side we had 30%, maybe we had 50%, we had these different things. And every time we ran the research, every time we ran the demo, residue reduced the erosion. Every time we did that and looked at the runoff, we says, boy, the residue didn't change the runoff much. You know, at the time the storm's occurring, it doesn't change it much. But when you look at what happens when the residue is gone, and when you build soil structure, there are big differences. Big differences, let's come back to evapotranspiration. The measurements, typically about one-fourth of our water that comes from rainfall is evaporated off from the soil surface, off a wet crop canopy, off a wet residue, lost to evaporation. The quicker you close the canopy, the less this will be. Now, the rest of the water goes through the soil system into the roots and is tra transpired by the crop to keep the crop cool and to grow more crop. Now, some people say take all the E out of ET, well, you can cut it in half roughly because it's still going to come off a wet surface, wet residue. But the more I can get into the soil, the more it goes through the crop, the more yield I get. Now, I throw this up. These are Nebraska numbers just to give you a quick reference in your mind. 
Western Nebraska ET is lower than Eastern Nebraska. You go, wait a minute, isn't it hotter and drier out west? The reason it's less out there is they use shorter season crops. If you get a 90-day corn versus 120-day corn, that's the difference in water use. It's growing longer, it uses more water. And look this direction. Alfalfa grows only about eight months a year compared to corn and beans only about five months a year. Wheat grows in the cool of the winter, cool of the spring, uses less water. So there's all sorts of things that affect ET. But think about those when you're using water. A cover crop in the off season of corn and soybeans is in this cooler season. It's going to use less water simply because it is a less water intensive time of year. Something that grows year round uses more water. Again, if you got excess water, grow something to use the water. So that's why I just throw these up for ET. But when Norm Clocky was at Nebraska, he was measuring ET and he separated out again what was off the evaporation, what was transpiration. And what was amazing, sort of, is 16.8 was transpiration. I can show you producers in Nebraska that pump 20 to 30 inches of water a year, which means they're wasting the irrigation water and it means they aren't even using the rainfall. And again, evaporation, let's cut that in half if we can. Norm went out there and he took just 5,000 pounds per acre equivalent of wheat straw, spread it out there. Two different years data here. Just by taking a bare soil and covering it, he cut evaporation roughly in half. Growing a crop, he also cut it in half because he cut the wind and sun off the soil surface and residue in a crop cut it even more yet. Grow something, protect the soil. Keep the sun and wind off the soil surface. A lot of people say, well, I never have this condition over here. Sure you do. If you don't have a cover crop and you've done tillage, you've got that. If you leave the residue there, it's worth a lot more. If I do residue and a cover crop, it's worth a lot more to save water. He's Norm since moved to Garden City, Kansas. Here's corn residue, wheat residue, straight no-tilling in, soybeans and corn. This is simply this difference now. So he did the math for you. He finds two to four to almost five inches of water saved by reducing that evaporation. So let's put this on here. We start running total here, by the way. You know, here's a crop, sunflowers. Sunflowers are supposed to be drought resistant because they root down deeper, right? 2005 was a drought year in southeast Nebraska. The sunflowers burned up because of a lack of residue. If you don't have residue there and that evaporation, I just lost five inches. That was my crop. 2005, there were some neighbors there that says, you know, I have to chop silage to harvest what I can to feed my livestock. True. Now, the next spring, when they went in and planted their corn, it was a dry year, that corn burned up. There's not an ear there. On part of the field they left to run the combine through just so he could get his insurance payment, had to run a grain yield, had residue there, the corn is still green and it's forming an ear. The residue he took away that year cost him the next year, the little bit he left was a plus. Now the guys are starting to argue, well you get the drought year and you got that short corn out there, what do you do? There's a lot of guys who run their combine through it just to spread the residue and process the residue. They're not taking it away because they know the value of the residue. So a researcher out that way, uh, West Central Research Extension Center is at North Platte, Nebraska. He went in straight soybean residue and raked away some and left the other there. Now he did a nutrient testing. He made sure nutrients weren't a limiting factor. This is simply the residue mulch. He irrigated the rest of the field based upon the residue level. This was under irrigated because of the evaporation, and you can see how much yield he lost. Well, some guys say, well, just irrigate more to make up for this. Oh, wait, that costs money. Don't do that. Or you're the drylander. Here is wheat after harvest. Left the straw in place, and in part of the field, he baled the straw because he needed some straw bales. Gave up 20 bushels. This guy figured out he buys his bales from the neighbor because the neighbor hasn't figured it out yet. He leaves his residue in the field. The next year, Steve Melvin at our Curtis Research Farm. It was a good rainfall year. His dry land yields weren't that much reduced. Yeah, there's some. Look, they were reduced both, though, when he removed residue. We got guys down there in southeast Nebraska that don't even allow silage to be chopped in their farms because the yield they give up when that residue disappears. And one of those farms is our University of Nebraska Research Farm. The agronomy group already figured this out, and the animal science group is mad because they got to buy the silage from the neighbors. The neighbors haven't figured it out yet. Again, that residue is what drives this soil system. I can't afford to give it up. Here's uh, back to my tillage plots. In uh, 2005, first week of June, we had five days in a row over 100 degree heat. 
Now it cooled off and it rained. Where there was no residue in the till, that sorghum basically went dormant. Now it didn't die, you can see all the plants are still there, but look where, how healthy that growth is. When the rain came, this took off, and we didn't expect too much yield difference. When the combine rolled, it was 35 bushel difference. 2000 was a year that during the growing season we got 11 inches of rain. County average for soybeans that year was 23 bushel per acre, or 25 bushel per acre, I'm sorry. My tilled soybeans were 23 on 11 inches of rain. My no-till is 47. I can't give up that residue. Earlier I said rainfall simulator. We said not much difference in runoff. Big difference in erosion. We had one site when we were doing all this research that uh, when we stood there, and on the tilled side, we got runoff after about 20 minutes of water applied. That's an inch of water in 20 minutes. And all the farmers standing there said, see, tilling it, you open it up, the water can soak in. On the other side, where residue was standing, we stood there for an hour and a half. Three and three quarter inches of water applied before we saw any runoff. And we said, boy, this site's not like the other 21 sites that we just done. This one's wrong. I'm sorry to say this was the right site. Charlie Finster had a no-till as a chem fallow versus tillage fallow, so what this plot was. He'd been there for 13 years already. 13 years of no-till built it such that three and three quarter inches of water soaked in before we saw the first runoff compared to this one, one inch of water. That single storm is two and three quarter inch of water difference because of the soil structure of long-term no-till. Again, long-term no-till, this is from my tillage plots. Tile spade full of soil, you can see the good peds and aggregates. You can see where water can soak in compared to the tilled where it's denser. You can't see the water soak in. Now before taking this picture, I should have lined this up four inches lower than that because the soil surface is four inches lower. Wasn't thinking when I snapped the picture. But now some interesting work coming out of France. See that good soil structure? The heat from the earth rises up through those same holes and they are measuring in no-till fields in March being about five to 10 degrees warmer than tilled fields in March. And it's because this tillage making it more dense and no pore space there, the heat can't rise. I started paying attention to that on our usage farm. We started measuring soil temperatures. Our no-till where the water can soak in and heat can come up is the same soil temperatures as our tilled. In fact, with the soil structure, we can plant our no-till before our tilled neighbors can plant theirs. And again, remember I said I had soybeans into heavy wheat straw 15th of April and conventional till neighbors aren't planting soybeans till May 5th because it's too cold? No-till soil structure solves a lot of the problems when you get air exchange, gas exchange, water movement. We've done some measurements on infiltration. I use controlled wheel traffic as well. Jim mentioned that in his final present, er, slide there. Till, two-tenths inch per hour could soak in. Four tenths on the soft row where we haven't driven, and this has hadn't been driven on it for more than 25 years. But the tillage makes that top layer so it doesn't take in water very fast. When we pulled out the NRCS soil survey and it said that the intake rate should be between two tenths and six tenths because of the clay content of the silty clay loam soil. That was. Now what's interesting though, this is saturated for more than 24 hours before we took this measurement. So this is not just initial intake, this is actually what's moving through the soil. Go to the no-till, there's six tenths, that's the high side of the two to, four, two to six. It's over four inches per hour there. Any of you who visits Dakota Lakes, Dwayne will show you this on his long-term no-till, but that water can just disappear, it soaks in when you build that structure. Southeast Nebraska, it's the typical spring thunderstorm blew through, and actually late spring, six inch rain came overnight from June 12th to 13th. We're out there walking around taking pictures, and as we're taking pictures of this field, it's got a crust on it, terrace is over top, terrace is washed out. The farmer drove up. He was just shaking his head, said, worthless rain. Just like anybody else, I said, how much did you get? He says, six inches. Worthless rain. Crested the soil, washed out the terraces. When am I gonna get in there? When's it gonna be dry enough for me to replant the grain sorghum? Worthless rain. His neighbor crossed the fence. Long-term no-tiller. Sorghum's already up. Soil structure's there. He took a soil moisture probe rod, had a full soil moisture profile to six feet deep, and sorghum, June 13th, six foot of moisture, he says, beautiful rain. The difference with soil structure, guys. All right, I put a question mark on the six. You don't always get that kind of thunderstorm. It's impressive, yes. We've easily measured two extra inches of water because of better infiltration, less runoff. And again, going back to that 11 inch rainfall year, 
61 with tillage to the line, no-till, 121. That's what we see when you get that infiltration and residue and soil structure and remember, I'm adding. This is working together. Aerial view of that research farm, 10 miles east of Lincoln, it's a terraced farm. The terraces were put in back in the 50s and 60s when they said, we got to control runoff. You know what, with controlled wheel traffic and long-term no-till and a nice broad crop rotation, we have next to no runoff. Very seldom do these terraces see water. Right here is a repair and buffer strip. This terrace basically defines the only runoff that comes through that buffer strip is off of this field. That buffer strip was put in in 1998 because everyone says we're going to put in buffers to filter everything coming out of the runoff. Was it Ray? I think you said it. Buffers are a Band-Aid. This field was no-tilled about 10 years already by then. 98, they put in the buffer. 99, they put in eight runoff samplers in front of the buffer and four behind so they can compare the water in, water out, see how effective the buffer was. About five years ago, they quit putting the runoff samplers out there in the spring because they have never measured runoff into that buffer. It all stays in that field. It doesn't run off. We raise 250 bushel corn dry land down here, dropping populations in dry land at 33,000 when our neighbors are raising 142 is the county average, and they're dropping about 25,000. I'm treating it like irrigated because we're using our water. Now again, our neighbors, they're using their terraces. We're keeping our water. All right, you've seen the running total, five to 12. I easily get the five extra. Did a meeting down in Boot Hill, Missouri. I was there for three days, it rained five inches. They get 50 inches of rain there. They had land levelers trying to get the land level to get rid of the water. Then you looked in the background and they had pivots. I'm going 50 inches of water and you got pivots? Yeah, when the rain stops in June, it stops till September. We need irrigation. I go, 50 inches of rain? They have a tilled soil that's not letting the water soak in. It's all running off. They need irrigation. He's been there. He's nodding. We go to Minnesota. We switch to no-till. We go to Iowa, Illinois, wherever. We switch to no-till. We used to be corn, soybeans with tillage. We had runoff. We had evaporation. And we had 30 inches of rain, 40 inches of rain, whatever they get. And they say 5 to 12. Remember, corn only used 16.8. They say 5 to 12, what's the first thing they do? They complain about cold, wet soil. They say, I'm going to get rid of that by doing strip till. Blow off that spring soil moisture. They also set themselves up. Again, this is a norm clock. You're leaving the door open. Uh, soil moisture leaves them all season long, not just that time of year, all year long. So again, some people till the water out, and they continue to lose the water all year. For me, it's up to you what you do with the extra water that no-till saves. You know, a drought year, that's your crop. In a non-drought year, that's opportunity to do something else. You know, irrigators. In Nebraska, the average for center period irrigation is about $15 an acre inch. Saving five inches, the low end, is 75 bucks an acre more profit. You're the dry lander. The low end again, remember I said five to 12. Corn responds about 12 bushels per acre inch. Five times 12 is 60 extra bushels of corn. We are running at our Rogers Memorial Farm the past five years. We are more than 60 bushels above county average on our no-till corn. We're running over 200 bushel corn where the county average is 140. That's where my extra water is. Beans, three and a half times five is 17 and a half. Again, that's extra profit if you use your water. It comes down to can you use your water? Can you store your water? Out west, it used to be wheat fallow because they didn't think they had enough water to grow a crop every year. They're using no-till, using residue, and they're raising a the crop every year. They're using their extra water that no-till gives them. Down south, Oklahoma and Kansas used to be a lot of wheat fallow. They went to no-till. They learned they can raise continuous crops. They went to no-till, and they actually learned they can use double crop because they're growing wheat that uses less water in the off-season. They go beans, uses the water when the water is available. It comes down to timing now. When's your water available? Producer I know in Pennsylvania, he says, you know, we got wet springs. I grow alfalfa because it's a high water use crop. It starts using water clear back in March. I take first cutting, and by then it's already used 8 to 10 inches of water. He says, I wait for regrowth. I plant corn. I spray out the alfalfa, and I raise good corn. He gets 40 inches of rain. 10, 15 went to the alfalfa. The rest went to the corn. He says, I got conventional till neighbors who plow up their alfalfa to kill it set themselves for erosion and runoff, they plant their corn, and the erosion and runoff, no water getting in the soil profile, and their corn droughts out. He says, I'm a no-tiller, and I got two crops, and they got zero. 
They're using the extra water. Extreme case in Nebraska. After corn harvest, plant wheat, plant it in skip rows. You plant your soybeans. That when you combine your wheat, your soybeans are already there. They're using the extra water. Now, I say extreme case in Nebraska. This is the dry land corner on a pivot. The beans got up this high and died because the wheat already used all the water. Now, back east in Illinois, Indiana, on into Ontario, they love it and they call it relay cropping. We got a living root there almost year round. With irrigation, we got that living root and they're raising good wheat and good corn, or good soybeans using that extra water. And they're keeping track of the irrigation and it's only putting on six extra inches of water. Because of the no-till and the rainfall, they only need six extra for two crops in a year. So again, think about using the water. And again, I look at how much water can you store. We have some potential losses. If we have a soil profile that's already full, we get extra water. In Nebraska, we have trouble with deep percolation taking nitrogen down to our drinking water. If we use some of that water growing a cover crop, we can reduce the nitrate leaching. Dwayne's going to talk more about catch and release nutrients. We have a crusted soil or saturated soil. Again, we lose water, build structure, protect it. Or if it's unprotected soil, we got evaporation, we lose water, leave residue out there. And again, once you're full, it's wasted. Now, in a normal spring in Nebraska, we hope to have our soil moisture profile refilled by March. We don't plant until maybe April or May. I got an opportunity for a cover crop to use water. Well, if it's going to be a dry year, maybe I'll look at a fall cover crop to empty out water in the fall such that I can save water in the spring. You go, huh? Think about it. If it's got a wet fall and it fills up right away, everything in the winter is wasted. Sometimes you make the cover crop decision on the fly. And the main thing is I'm going to grow the water rather than lose it because I'm going to be growing a root and growing soil structure. Talk quickly about cover crops here for my last Oh, I got 17 minutes. That's not bad then. Ralph Derps, a friend of mine, he's a crop consultant, uh, learned no-till back at least 40 years ago, and he's been sort of the leader in getting no-till started in South America. He's living in Paraguay now, and he started with the German government. He's gone into areas that have never been tilled, never been farmed before, and they're planting no-till. And I say that because they're not used to the big tractors we have. They're using a lot smaller tractors. They're not invested in the horsepower for tillage. They've never seen the soil bare. They think it's logical to have it covered. We've seen it bare thanks to grandpa, thanks to dad. So we're not used to seeing the residue near as much. But they're out there planting. And what they're doing is they're using cover crops to provide extra carbon biomass to the soil system, to use some water to protect the soil, to build the soil. And to them, cover crops is a no-brainer. Now, the interesting thing, I, when you start thinking about it, and we saw this on a slide earlier, but when you think about when is the crop using water, when's the water available? Our summer planted crops, and you could substitute, just move this axis over and call this fall or winter crops if you're doing wheat. But think about it, they take off growing in the spring. Corn, that's sometime in May, they're really actively growing. They reach a peak in July. They taper off that in September, they're done using water. That's when we produce the biomass, that's when it uses the water. But from an ARS study where they took this, they said that we missed some opportunities to produce, I love their big words, resource simulation, dry matter production. I say they basically are losing the opportunity to use some water and some carbon dioxide and also sunlight. Now, think about it. Sunlight we don't store, at least not in a crop field. Carbon dioxide we don't use in a crop field in the off season. Now, when a crop is growing, there is. So that's what the cover crop's for. Now, water we can store. And some people argue, well, this water, it's not really lost if I can store it and use it for next year's crop. But too often I see where the soil might be already full and this is now deep leaching, or it's deep percolation, or it's evaporation off an unprotected surface. In the spring, with heavy spring rains, it is again. Again, by planting a cover crop, I can use some water and accumulate some biomass, and more importantly, get some roots in that soil and use some of that carbon dioxide and sunlight rather than wasting it. Use some water, but I have to manage the water. And that's why I show the break off here. If it is a wet spring, you let that cover crop grow longer, use some water, because you got plenty of water, and that break off might even occur out here. Or if it's dry spring, it might break off here. Or if it's always dry in your area, plant a cover crop that winter kills, and there's nothing that even appears here. Again, the water management is up to you, a little bit on your risk, and a little bit on what you're trying to accomplish. And when I say what you're trying to accomplish, again, here's down in South America. 
when they first started raising soybeans down there, a lot of people said, well, it's beans on beans every acre, every year, and that's what kills our soybean market in the U.S. Well, I had an opportunity to go down to Brazil, and Ray Ward was along on that trip last year, and we saw a lot of acres, beans on beans every year. But you know what? After soybean harvest, they had enough growing season, enough sunlight, and carbon dioxide, and water, they grew a cover crop. This is black oats in this case, rolled down. Or it could have been a short season forage because they had livestock, or it could have been corn or cotton, and they grew those through the winter months. Again, using a crop growing when the water's available is what they're doing. Now, when it comes to pest management, beans on beans, when that first rainstorm comes and hits that black oats residue, how much bean disease is going to splash on that new beans crop? None. A cover crop can be a pest management tool, reducing splash in this case. The thing I encircled here is this tree in the background. That's the same tree a few weeks later, and you look at that and say the beans don't look bad, and you look at that and you go, where'd the rest of that residue go? The biological life is digesting it, putting it in the system, and like I said, that's when I want it to happen when the next crop is growing. I thought it was pretty neat. I thought it was really neat when Ralph showed me this. That's what it does when you grow a crop, cover crop, and using the sunlight and carbon dioxide when it's available, using the water to grow the soil by having that living root in there. It's feeding the soil system. So what do you grow? I've got this seed box in my pickup right now. These are some different cover crops I've planted in different plots. People always ask me, what do you plant? I go, what are you trying to do? The laundry list that I borrowed from our Nebraska NRCS and their cover crop plan, they put erosion control on top. That's where the name actually come from, is cover, to reduce the soil erosion. If I want erosion control, I want to quit growing something like a grass to get it up there and absorb rain down impact. What if I'm doing nutrient capture, nutrient cycling? I want something that takes up a lot of nutrients and then releases it slowly next year. And again, Dwayne's going to talk catch and release nutrients. Improve soil health. Any living root will do that. Water management, the two-edged sword. Use the water if you have it, or better yet, grow some residue to keep the sun and wind off the soil's surface to conserve the water that you don't have. It can work both ways. Increase biodiversity by simply getting a cool season versus a warm season, a broadleaf versus a grass. It just change the biodiversity to change that soil biological life. Balance carbon nitrogen ratio. If you want residue to hang around a long time, you want a high carbon out there. Corn stalks, wheat straw hang around a long time compared to peas or soybeans will break down in a hurry because it's got a low carbon, higher nitrogen ratio. Well, again, if I want to decay my residue and I got a lot of corn stalks or wheat stubble there, put a legume out there and you decay your residue in a hurry. Or if I'm like me, I got a lot of soil biological life and I don't want it to decay as fast, I'm going to put more high carbon stuff out there, more grass, more rye get the residue to hang around longer. Nitrogen fixation, that's what the early days, most people looked at cover crops to grow nitrogen because we were organic producers before they invented fertilizer. Well, we got organic producers or we got others who are cutting their nitrogen because they're growing their own. Reduced compaction, it's a two-edged sword there as well. The one is, yes, it can when you got a good vigorous root growing. But the more important thing is the good vigorous root actually provides some soil structure and stability to reduce the compaction from next trips on the field, getting that root out there. Weed suppression, the right selected cover crop can suppress the next weeds. You just want to make sure you select the right cover crop doesn't suppress your next crop. And again, that's why I can't tell you what you need to plant because I don't know what you're doing next. Forage or grazing, I do that for the soil system, but again, some years, drought conditions, maybe I need that for my four-legged livestock to eat T-bones out of. And so again, we got to think about it. Like I say, a lot of cover crop tours out there. You go out there and look at them, usually they're planted in single species just so you can see the individual crop. You get benefits of mixing them in a cocktail. The benefits build and it uh, really helps you out that way. But this is a set of legumes then, seeing how much nitrogen they fix, planted into wheat stubble. Uh, or in this case, into wheat stubble. Cover crop used a uh, sorghum sudan, grows in the heat of the summer, doesn't use a lot of water, but the good news is it's up and growing that when his pastures and rangeland need a rest, he can put the livestock over here, they get feed, Recovery time on pasture and rangeland is worth big bucks. That'll pay for your cover crop because you get the cattle off of there. So again, we gotta think about how we manage the system. Again, we're selecting a cover crop. First question, what do you wanna do with it? Well, I wanna plant it because it's the hottest topic out there. That's not the reason to do it. That's why so many lemmings go over the cliff. They've never asked why, it's just everyone else is doing it. No. Why do you want to do it? And again, what do you select then? Can you grow it? It doesn't matter if it's something that really works great in South America and they can't grow here. 
Black oats, for instance, if you want to raise black oats for seed, you got to move south a long ways. It only takes about 170 days to mature it. Now, for a cover crop, I don't need 170 days because it doesn't need to mature. Can you manage it? Can you kill it? Can you plant it? Can you row? Again, you would select something you can't. Will it affect the next crop? One of my favorite examples is at harvest time when you're hauling wheat to the elevator and they refuse it because of scab. And uh, someone walks up to you and say, I'll buy that wheat from you because I'm going to use it as cover crop seed. You'd be glad just to sell it, right? Well, I plant that scab wheat as a cover crop and it comes up and I spray it up before it makes a head. It never gets head scab. Who cares? I'm planting my next crop is soybeans. Who cares? I plant my next crop is corn. Fusarium head scab and Fusarium stock rot is the same Fusarium, guys. You just shot yourself in the foot when it comes to raising corn if you use wheat as a cover crop in front and had Fusarium. So again, will it affect the next crop? I see the same thing with sunflowers and white mold, things like that, so be careful. What will the seed cost? My cheapest cover crop seed has been floor sweepings. Well, my next cheapest has been bin run grain sorghum. You know, milo is not worth much. Milo is planted at five pounds an acre. A bushel of milo is 56 pounds. It'll plant 10 acres for about three bucks, four bucks, five bucks, depending upon the price. Milo is a warm season grass. Following wheat, it's perfect because that's a cool season grass. So again, how does it fit? What would the seed cost? The best is what is left in your seed shed when you're done seeding. Dump it all together and plant it because you know you can grow it all. Will it help the soil system? I sure hope so. That's why I'm doing it. And again, some cover crops won't help as much. Again, different species out there. Here's flax. Flax, I used to think, not think too much of it until we had two inch hail for 20 minutes with two inches of rain with 80 mile hour winds. Everything in the area was destroyed except for my flax cover crop. This isn't it, this is a different plot. The flax cover crop is such a small, spindly thing, it sprang back up, and the day after the hailstorm, you're walking out there and go, how come it missed that strip? It didn't. That plant was that resilient. Now, I contrast that to this one right next to it. That's sun hemp. It's a lagoon, fixes nitrogen. Sun hemp, as the name implies, is a rope. I would spray that out sooner than this producer did because, you know, as a rope, any residue mover on your planter and it's turning wraps up so tight that you need a torch to get it out. This producer says, don't run residue movers, you just plant right through it. I go, that works? He goes, great, it works. So again, what are you after? If you're after residue cover, grasses will provide that fastest. If you're after nitrogen, it has to be a legume. And you have to inoculate it with a proper inoculant for that species. Just because you planted soybeans before doesn't mean there is over here there that's going to help you on peas or vetch or even alfalfa. They're all different. You use the right one. Brassicas, a lot of people look at them for getting rid of the compaction because the brassica family includes the oilseed radish and the turnips, those big roots. But they're also notorious for residue cycling because they will break down the residue underneath them. Others, the others category, that's, I already showed you flax. That's not any of these. Sunflowers is an other. Biodiversity is what I'm after. Cool season versus warm season, it's pretty obvious. To really get the good growth, you plant the opposite of what your cash crop is. Following wheat harvest, a cool season crop, I do a warm season because in the heat of July and August, you want a warm season sorghum, Sudan, or soybeans, or cowpeas that are growing out there. Now, going the other way, after a warm season crop like corn or soybeans, I'm going to go cool season, my Austrian winter peas, even a spring pea, oats, all my cool season crops. Grass versus broadleaf versus cocktail. Again, that's balancing the carbon nitrogen ratio. Cocktail gets you the balance of everything. And it gives you some risk management as well. What if it is too hot and dry and the cool season legume you planted burned up while well, my warm season grass might be still growing? So again, it gives you some management. If you need to learn more about cover crops, ARS out of Mandan put together this periodic table, just like the one you hated in chemistry. It is sorted by, down the column, they're related. Again, grasses, down the ends. Simpler things on top, more complex in the bottom. Then it's grouped also within column by legumes here, broadleafs here, warm season, cool season. And they've got these little footnote things in the corners here on their life cycle, their water use, and how they grow. Again, you'll say, huh? Well, if I'm in an area of wind erosion, I want an upright. If I'm in an area of water erosion, I want something that lays flat. Again, just think about differences, what you need out there. 
But then you're saying, okay, what in the world's a lupin? You click on that, and if you run it online, it goes straight to the file, or you can download it to your computer. It's a PDF file, and it's available again on that website. You click on lupin, and it comes up saying, here's what it looks like, here's what it is. Cool season broadleaf, legume, goes down, low water use, acid soil. If you're going to feed it, it's got some protein. If you want the bonus points in your CSP plan, it attracts the pollinators. But you know what? It doesn't form my mycorrhiza associations. Again, will it build soil? This one not as fast because it's not going to help the fungi near as much. Or you click on cereal rye, one of my favorites because I don't raise a lot of wheat in our area. Uh, cool season grass, following corn or soybeans, it's great. Annual, upright. Upright catches more snow forming. High water use. Well, that's why I'd be careful when I kill it in the spring. Do I kill it later or early? Is it a wet or dry spring? It'll go on down here, you know, uh, will form mycorrhiza association. Very good at scavenging nitrogen. Again, once you decide why you need a cover crop, you can go to a table like this and help you decide which cover crop do you need. Again, the cocktails are nice. Here's after wheat harvest, a cocktail that had a cool season legume, warm season legume, brassicas, warm season grass, cool season grass. This is after the first frost, the warm season grass of the sorghum Sudan frosted off. The cool season grasses underneath are still growing. In fact, they'll really take off now that the weather cooled down. Likewise, the brassicas are still growing down here. They'll take cooler temperatures. Again, when you start thinking about managing the cover crop, can you kill it? Can you manage it? A cover crop roller. Rollers work great on a single species because you know exactly when to roll it. You're supposed to roll it about the time it's starting to do reproduction. Now you got this cocktail mix here. When do you roll that? I'm not exactly sure. Well, wait a minute. If this stuff already frost killed and the rest of this is going to frost kill, maybe I don't even need to worry about a roller. So again, how are you going to terminate? It depends what you're growing. The cover crop rollers, they love them in South America. Here's again from Ralph Derps. This is a black oats crop rolled down, no herbicide. Those, that black oats is suppressing all the weeds, raising that corn. So again, weed control there. Some guys say, oh, I can use tillage to terminate the, rubber, the cover crop. Remember, they told us for years, you plow under that green manure crop. When it comes to soil biological life, it's exactly the worst thing to do. Yes, I put that residue into the soil, but I destroyed a lot of other stuff as well. We got a grad student in Nebraska working on a PhD in organic weed control using cover crops. He had two, four, six, and eight species cover crops. He found that once you got to six or eight species, you could suppress weeds. When you're down at two or four, you actually almost increased weeds. He found that when you terminated them with a disc, you increased weeds because you planted every weed seed and you got rid of the benefit. When he used a blade undercutter and he left the residue on top, then the eight species cover crop paid for the organic production. So again, we've got to think about what's going on out there. Don't use tillage to kill it, guys. Use the herbicide, use the roller, or you plant into it. Wait, before I can tell you to do that, check with your RMA, check with your insurance, check with your FSA. In Nebraska, I can guarantee if you do this, your crop is not insurable. If you plant into a cover crop, or worse yet, if your cover crop even heads or buds, your next crop is not insurable. We have to kill our cover crop early in Nebraska if you want crop insurance. But you know what? Terry Taylor in Illinois, he's got excess water. He's growing the excess water out. He's planting. He's got a beautiful mulch there. That planter actually was his cover crop roller who really knocked it back for him. And his one post emerge herbicide took care of the rest of it. He didn't have pre plant didn't have a whole bunch of other stuff out there. But again, we start thinking about it. Think about growing it, terminating it, but why are you growing it? It's going to increase that soil biological life. If you have a soil surface that has no residue and you've got a lot of evaporation, Use a little bit of water to grow the cover and it reduces the evaporation. I'm going to throw up some data. You mentioned the group up at uh, Marlin Richter up at uh, North Dakota. Bismarck, he had about 15 inches of annual rain. After pea harvest, he had very little residue. He planted a cover crop. It all frost killed. The next spring, he had beautiful residue. And over here, he had no residue. And over here, he had weeds. Where he had the residue, he had less weeds. So he saved a herbicide application. He had the residue there. It saved water. And when they took these measurements the day of corn planting in May, going down to four foot, basically no difference. What's interesting is look on top where there was no cover, the soil was exposed and it dried out. Where he had cover, he actually saved water near the soil surface to plant into. So numbers I got from Duane. He only went to three feet. And this is 20 inch rainfall area onto a wheat stubble. Again, with a cover crop that frost killed, this is spring planting time. 
he had more moisture near the surface because he kept the sun and wind off the soil surface. And not only then, all the way until the crop canopy took over. So it saves even more water going into the next season, the cover crop does. Again, here's on our Rogers Memorial Farm, that's 200 bushel corn the day after harvest, I'm planting a cover crop. Austin winter peas. A lot of people say you got too much residue there. You know what, that drill just put the residue in contact with the soil microbes, this is long-term no-till. Next spring, March 1, this is the same field. Where's, also our, where's all my residue? Soil microbes are digesting it. The cover crop is starting to grow. That's Austin winter peas, March 15th. By the time it came time to plant, about April 20th, those Austin winter peas fixed about 90 pounds of nitrogen. That paid for the cover crop. It cycled my residue. I'm getting excited about cover crops. Here's uh, Keith Gluen, extension educator, planting some 20 inch corn in this demonstration plot. This is irrigated corn on corn with a cereal rye cover crop. We had corn, rye cover crop, corn, rye cover crop, rye corn cover crop. This is the fourth year of corn. We took a conventional tilled field and with seven crops, remember four corn, three cover crops, we stepped up biology activity such that here's the rye sprayed out, we're planting the corn. Here's a few weeks later, where's all the rye residue? Where's all the irrigated corn residue? Breaking down because of the biology activity. Fly it on, it could be an option. In soybeans, we're getting good luck in Nebraska because the soybeans, we do it right before leaf drop, the seed falls down to the ground, the leaves cover it up, it's the mulch, the soybean mulch allows the cover crop to grow. In corn, you fly it on, there's a lot up here in the leaves, never make it to the soil until the combine runs. And you don't make the mulch like the dropping leaves do. We don't recommend it in Nebraska and corn. In fact, Lori Elkhorn NRD will pay the cost of the flying to put it on because they want the erosion control. Helicopter, they're using that. The fun thing about a helicopter, it doesn't have to return to the airport. They put the totes out the day before. Each tote held enough seed for 40 acres. Helicopter just dropped the tote, slid to the side, dumped the tote in, they did 1,300 acres in one afternoon. And it looks like this then at harvest time. This is a sandy soil, it couldn't store all the off-season precip. His cover crop's already growing when he combined the beans, protection is there. Keeping the sun and wind off the soil surface, this producer reported those bean, uh, the cover crop, corn, did about 20 bushel per acre better than where he had sandy soils without a cover crop because he kept the sun and wind off the soil surface. Other guys spread it with dry fertilizer. Guys in Iowa do a lot of that. Mix their 1152O with some cover crop seed. When they get out there and spin it, they get enough rain, they get the fertilizer on, they get the cover crop up. Some guys use the drill. They're putting on the fertilizer for the next crop. They're putting on a cover crop for this crop. Again, different ways of getting it out there. Some put it with the manure. Now, dry feedlot manure is a little hard, but a lot of Michigan work and Pennsylvania work mixing it with slurry, and when they spread the slurry, it gets incorporated. Or they spread it with a dry spreader, and then they do a manure application across the top, like with an airway or something, and they incorporate it. Or in this case, feedlot manure spread, harrowed to smooth it out. The drill then cut up the rest of the residue. And this is actually great to reduce nutrient runoff loss from surface applied manure. Because a lot of those nutrients are now tied up in a biological form, be released later. In corn, I say we don't fly it on. If you got hybrid seed corn production, there's not much canopy there. They do fly it on in hybrid seed corn production. Or they do it when they destroy the male row. Here's the cover crop already starting to come up. Here's a few weeks later when the corn was harvested. I like that. Hybrid seed corn production, you over fertilize and over water. The cover crop's an excellent scavenger. We already saw a couple of these. I'm going to repeat them. Here's a seed corn producer who's got a detasseler. He says, I detasseled my hybrid seed corn, but you know what? The tassel's not needed in regular corn after it's pollinated. He goes out there and detasseles the regular corn and he's blowing cover crop seed underneath. We already saw this one. A lot of guys say, well, you can't cover much ground. You know what? At night, it's a nice cover. Build a bigger spreader. This is 90 feet wide. You can cover some ground. This one's got some ground clearance. And again, they're doing that to get the cover crop seeded in that growing corn. But again, talk to your insurance man. In Illinois, they can do that. In Nebraska, if I see that cover crop and growing corn, they're going to say there's new crops growing and your previous crop is no longer insured. Depends. Talk to them before you do it. Again, summary. After low residue crop, let's grow some residue. After corn silage or wheat, because there I've got a longer growing season to do that. 
And again, here's the one that catches a lot of people by surprise. If you got a sandy soil, it can't, can't store all your off-season precip. Maybe a cover crop is something to consider. Use the water when it's available rather than lose it. Dig in the soil. That black is the roots. You get more roots out there, perennial crops, cover crops, drilled crops, winter crops. You're going to build that soil. Carlos Crevetto, about a 40-year no-tiller down in South America. Grain belongs to the farmer, residue belongs to the soil. I believe in that. Again, quick commercial for our crop production, crop scouting newsletter in Nebraska. With that, I bumped the pause button here. So it didn't vibrate on me. It says I got five minutes left, but I'm sorry, I went into your break. I'll be around to answer questions during the break because I don't want to short you visiting our exhibitors because they help pay for this.